everybody, welcome. Um, excited for this episode of Small Business Storytellers. If you're new here, my name is Seth Silvers. And on this show, we bring you some of the best business stories that you've probably never heard. And excited today uh, to introduce to you guys somebody you probably already know, which is Kelly. Kelly's been uh, pretty popular here on the Fireside app this week. So Kelly, thanks so much for joining me. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be on your podcast and thanks thanks for inviting me up here. Yeah, absolutely. So as we get started, um, over the next 30 minutes or so, we're going to dive into Kelly's story, um, which is super fun um, and unique just because of the space that she's in. So we're going to dive into her story, some of the challenges that she's had with building a business. Kelly, as we get started, just give those of us that haven't you know, done all the research on you. Give us some context for who are you and kind of what is what does your life look like right now? What are you what are you doing with your life? Yeah. So uh, my name is Kelly Vaughn. I am the founder and CEO of the Tap Room. It's a Shopify Plus development agency that focuses on custom development solutions for high growth businesses on Shopify and Shopify Plus. I have been in the e-commerce space for almost seven years now. I've been building websites since I was 11 years old. And currently right now, I am sitting in my second office uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, and it's sunny outside, and I really should be sitting outside, but my podcasting equipment is inside. Yeah, uh, that that is one of the problems of once you're once you start actually getting podcast equipment, it's like you're kind of held to where your equipment is. But <laughs> exactly. you sound you, you sound great. I know you just got some new gear this week, so sound great, and we're excited to be joining you in what, studio. Did you say that you started? building websites when you were 11 years old. I don't want to gloss over that. Can you like <laughs> tell us a little bit about that? Because that's not how most 11 year olds. Yeah, it is. It's definitely not the normal 11 year old activity. So uh, there's this website called Neopets. Uh, some people might be familiar with it. If you're not familiar with it, uh, it is a website where you could have your own virtual pet and you can dress it and feed it. You can play a bunch of games. And there was a community component to it as well. Um, these communities were called guilds. And I wanted to create my own guild. And in order to uh, customize it, I needed to know basic HTML and CSS. So I asked my dad to buy me a, a book to teach me how to code. Uh, it's called HTML Goodies. I believe you can technically still buy a copy of it. It's incredibly out of date at this point. But that's how I got my start. I, I started learning how to code when I was 11. And I actually, and we can get into my story a little bit later, but I actually started freelancing when I was 14 years old. That's amazing. And you wrote a, like, you literally, I mean, you wrote the book on freelancing. <laughs> yes, I wrote a book called Start Freelancing Today, uh, talking about how I got started and how you can get started with freelancing. And, yeah, like, and it takes you all the way from forming your business to scaling your business. So lots of co to cover in there. Um, again, Start Freelancing Today. And you can visit the website for it at startfreelancing.today, or you can find it on Amazon. It's available as an ebook and an audiobook. Yeah, which is amazing. Uh, and not a lot of people write a book, much less. Um, what was the first like platform that you built? Your so I started building, well, in order to like, learning how to code, I, I used Microsoft front page to build my first few websites. Um, I dabbled with Dreamweaver uh, when I when I worked at... Uh, I, rem I remember Dreamweaver. Yeah. I think I was, I remember playing with it. Yeah, I... It's probably middle school. It's probably eighth or ninth grade and like, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, I, I used to sell MySpace themes uh, when I was, yes. in, I guess that would have been, what years was MySpace around? Was it middle school or high school? Well, okay. Do you, it's kosher for me to ask how old you are? I'm 30. <laughs> okay. So I'm 30 as well. So we're, I, I knew we were around the same age. So I know for me, MySpace was, I think it was like eighth and ninth grade. And that was when I remember, get, you know, getting into learning how to, you know, swap out the image text in the back in the code of a MySpace page. And that, I remember doing that in like eighth or ninth grade. OK, yeah, that that sounds that sounds about right. So it would have been around that around that time. Um, and I built various communities over time um, when I was in, uh, I think, 
late high school, um, I was a really big uh, American Idol fan, and I built a fan site for David Archuleta. I think it was like the fifth or seventh season of American Idol. And, oh, my gosh. Yeah, I had like it was a forum on there with thousands of users. And actually, David Archuleta's dad had reached out to me and it was like, hey, love the website. Uh, after we do like what's when we start doing the, the American Idol summer tour, do you want to come to one of the shows and then come backstage and meet him? And I'm like, yes, this is my dream come true. So I still have all of the pictures of when I uh, when I went backstage for the American Idol post show. That is amazing. Uh, was it around that time that you started realizing like, okay, this whole web thing is what I want to do. So that's the funniest thing. I did not want to do development as a career. When I was in high school, I was like, there's no, there's no way I would be happy doing this full time as a career. If I was forced to do it, I would grow to hate it. And so I went to college for something entirely different. What did you end up going to college for? So after changing my uh, degree choice uh, like four times, as one usually does in undergrad, I eventually settled on psychology. And then I continued on from uh, from undergrad into grad school and got two master's degrees in public health and clinical social work. Okay, so those are definitely different than development. Uh, (laughs) Yes. Tell me about, you know, like, did you get into those and then realize you wanted to make more David Archuleta fan sites? Or, like, what was the transition <laughs> kind of from, I'm imagining you probably did some work in those arenas? I did, yes. So I I did, I, my, my primary focus was on childhood obesity prevention all through the MPH and uh, social work program, um, more on the public health side and the the social work side, which is really funny because I use my my social work degree literally every single day now. Um, But I was actually freelancing all through undergrad and grad school because college is really expensive and never really grew to hate it. Um, I ended up getting my first quote unquote real job out of grad school, which was a fellowship at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, It was a two year fellowship program, one year, and then they would extend to two afterwards, but they wouldn't tell you whether they extended it because federal funding. (laughs) Um, And they needed somebody who had their master's in public health who also knew how to code. Uh, This is not going to come as any surprise whatsoever. I was the only applicant and they did let me know this two weeks into hiring me. And so that was my first full time job. So as soon as they realized just how well I could code, they're like, well, let's pivot this a little bit more to be less public health and more development at a really low rate. So I did not last long there. (laughs) Yeah. And it was um, so then after that job, did you kind of jump? towards like what you knew as far as freelancing and doing some development work? Yeah. So it was around that time that I discovered Shopify. I discovered it in, in 2014. Um, and I was still again freelancing even while I was at CDC. And I hit this pivot point where my fellowship was paying uh, a stipend of 45,000 a year. That's, that's the cap of what I could make there. Um, I was making more money freelancing on the side than I was through just the fellowship stipend. And uh, we shared yeah, we we shared cubicles there because again government and funding and spacing and my cube mate was like Kelly why are you here like why are, why don't you just do your own thing you clearly have work coming in just just do it so i thought long and hard about it and once my husband and I got married and I was able to get on his health insurance, that was really the the deciding factor for me. Like, can I have health insurance? And yeah. <laughs> so this yep. was September of 2015 and I, I jumped ship and I quit the fellowship program and I went full time into freelancing. Okay. This is amazing because uh, my business's birthday is September of 2015. That's amazing. I love it. So, so, yeah, same age. We started at the same time. So, and, and I mean, it was, it was a little more. Um, I mine was not as stable of a jump as you. I was, uh, you know, dating my now wife at the time, and, you know, if I would have gotten married, then I probably would have just like continued peanut butter sandwiches for lunch, and <laughs> you know, just like live out of my car or something. But uh, so, you know, that helped me to realize really quickly, like, okay, there's got to be some 
there's probably gotta be some supplemental income while we're building this business thing. And so, you know, I did some different freelancing and jobs along the way, but uh, yeah, the last five years has definitely been journey. I I'm curious. I love asking people like, what was the first thing that you ever like sold online? It's, it's always so interesting to hear uh, what the first thing you like created and sold and how much was it for? <laughs> All right. We got to go back to when I was 14 years old then, because that was my first yep. client. Uh, it was a family friend yep. uh, who ran a hunting supply store up in Michigan. That's where I grew up. And it was basically an e-commerce store minus the actual transactional component where you can check out. You just had to call or come in to place an order. Um, my payment for that was a T-shirt. That's that's hilarious you say that because oftentimes it's not you don't get money for your first thing. Exactly. I still have the T-shirt, too. Uh, it turns out that my um, <laughs> my dad just texted me out of the blue one day and with this picture of this really dirty shirt. And I'm like, why are you sending this to me? He's like, don't you recognize it? And I looked closer and saw the name Taylor's hunting supplies on it. And that was the that was the original business. And, you know, he meets up with me and hands me the shirt. It is so like dirty. It's missing a sleeve. And I'm like, what were you doing with this? And it turns out he'd been using it as a dust rag for years. It didn't realize what shirt it was. And so he did his best to clean it, like wash it as many times as he possibly could. And now I have the shirt. So eventually I'm going to frame it because it's basically my first dollar. Yeah, no, I think that's amazing. And uh, I also think it's kind of amazing that your dad used like one of the you know, an artifact of your legacy that changes oil. <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> but I, I asked that question to another person um, that they were in kind of the marketing and online sales space. And their first website, they sold for a gun. <laughs> a gun for a website, which they are in Oklahoma. So it does make sense, but it's always hilarious. What kind of things have you, uh, have you, have you done work for? So that's awesome to, that you still have the t-shirt and it'll be fun to see that framed one day. Yeah. I honestly, to be completely transparent, I lost it. It is somewhere in my house, but I will find it. Well, there you go. You, you get, you'll find it. So let's fast forward to now. You, you've came a long way since, you know, changing, uh, being on the t-shirt exchange and switching <laughs> out shirts for websites. Uh, what does your team look like now? Like you have, context for the scope of the work that you're doing because you have several like you have two podcasts you have um, a decent sized team like you're not just a freelancer now like you you have a great business so give us some scope uh for what it is you're doing now and how big is your team and different things yeah so i now have 10 full-time employees i've got about 10 additional contractors and I forgot the rest of the questions. <laughs> yeah, just like, I mean, you have two podcasts. Oh, so just, yes. yeah. Tell our audience a little bit about yeah. those. So I do have two podcasts. One is called Commerce <laughs> It's a podcast to help you succeed on Shopify. So it's very merchant focused. I actually co-host that with Rian Boitler, who is also on this app. And I also have yep. a second podcast called Ladybug Podcast. And this is a podcast with me and three other women in tech talking all things tech, career, and code. Um, that one we've been doing since 2019, I want to say. Um, and it's, it's grown really quickly, way faster than I was expecting, but we just recorded a, uh, an episode on e-commerce today. So of course it's, I still get to tie it back into the tap room. I also, uh, yeah. Do a weekly live stream on Twitch with a Shopify employee. Uh, we call it Kelly plus Kelly because my name is Kelly and his name is Thomas Kelly. So of, on brand. And so we're we're basically live or like building a Shopify store live. So any Shopify developer who's interested in theme development, uh, they can kind of see us in action and watch us actually build out this site. Uh, what else do I do? Yeah, which is amazing. Um, I mean, like in even with your... Uh... With the tea podcast, I can't, what's the name of it again? I can't remember. It's Commerce Tea. Commerce Tea. Like you guys do live reviews of, of sites and stuff. So I think that's an awesome thing about the media. You're showing people what's working and what's not and really showing them your experience. What made you want to be kind of take that more transparent, that more like generous, like I'm going to like kind of give away our knowledge perspective with content as opposed to feeling like 
you need to like keep it all really close to the chest and only share those secrets with people that are paying you. There are over a million merchants on Shopify for one thing. Um, there are so many, and, and we're talking, you know, plenty of other platforms out there where, where people are running a business as well, or just trying to get started running a business. When I started the agency, I did not know what in the world I was doing. And I was just making everything up as I go. Now that I've gotten, you know, seven years into working on e-commerce, there's a lot that I know. And there's a lot that I could share to help other merchants kind of get that leg up without having to, well, first off, Quite often, people are, don't have funding to start off with. And um, right. <laughs> seven years in, I'm not exactly a chief consultant at this point. And so I would just rather have that information be available so you can actually get a head start, get started, find your first customers, start getting some sales and start to optimize your store. And, you know, the dream would be at some point you grow so much to the point where you're an ideal client for the tap room. There's no point in keeping all that information in. Right. I mean, where else is it going to go? It's just going to sit there in my head forever. Yeah. And I, I've struggled with that too, because, you know, our, like the vision when I started my company story on was to help small businesses market with stories, like and to help them market authentically. So, you know, for the last five years, we've spent a lot of it working with anybody and everybody who had a story and wanted marketing and had $5 or more. Mm -hmm. Um, which isn't a sustainable business model. And so, you know, it took us a while to realize, you know, putting out content is really the best way to like be helping those people that aren't ready to hire you now. But, you know, if they're really intentional for the next year, then they can grow to the place where they are ready. I'd love to hear about that journey for you. Like, have you, um, you know, it sounds like you're, you're probably not the cheapest in town. You're probably not for the people that are, uh, you know, for the people that, uh, are looking for, you know, a $10 Shopify site, like has pricing and figuring out just like how to know your value in the marketplace. Has that been a challenge for you over the years? Without a doubt. Yes. Um, I have always undercharged and this has been a constant battle. Even now, as I'm moving up market, I still feel like I'm not charging enough. Um, and I'm, I'm like a complete open book when it comes to sharing my rates. And, and again, there are so many merchants on Shopify that I don't feel like it's really tough competition because there are enough age, there's enough work to go around for everybody. So I would rather kind of set the stage with, you know, whatever I can share to help other agencies grow as well. I would, I did not have that. I want them to have that. So, I mean, I was starting, I remember when I charged $3,000 for my first Shopify build, it was a custom website. This build, this business is now doing over $20 million annually. And this was three years ago. <laughs> and, you know, speaking, yeah, value-based pricing, that's terrible return for me. Um, and now, yeah. you know, our, our minimum engagement is 50,000. Yeah. Yeah. How did you, how did you, like, were there some moments, um, maybe some failures, maybe some lost contracts, maybe it was, uh, you know, realizing you took on a $50,000 project and only charged in $3,000. Like what were some moments that helped you to get to that place where you're like, I know our value. And I know I know what we're worth. I think one of the biggest turning points was if somebody believes that we can do the work, I'm the one who's holding us back by making or with for not making more money. I'm the one who's setting those rates yeah. and they're more than happy to pay more. And I think there have been times when we've lost projects, we've lost bids because we we did not charge enough. And if we're not we're not charging what they think we should be charging, they're going to see us as a budget agency and we're we're not going to be good enough to do the work, basically. So now I'm kind of taking right. it from the other perspective and I'm like, I'm just going to in keep on increasing my rates. If I get a yes on a proposal, bump up the, the price next time. We can't possibly take on every single mm. project week. We we do we get so many inbound leads. If everyone said yes, one, we're not charging enough. And two, I'm gonna have to somehow find the team members to actually get the work done. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you mentioned inbound leads, and this is completely unrelated to this, but your URL for your website is taproom.com. I'm curious what the highest amount that you have been offered for that URL is from some kind of brewery or beer Nobody company. Nobody has actually offered to buy it. 
Okay. I I'm sure paid, I'm sure one day it'll happen, but I think yeah. that's a that's a great URL that you have. Thank you. Yeah, I was at a McKellar bar in Copenhagen and as most good ideas come from drinking, um I was like, why don't I call it the tap room? Like call my agency the tap room because, you know, you're exchanging creative ideas at tap rooms and you create some you make some magic. I mean, there's so many good things that come out of tap rooms. And so I looked it up and it was available for resale uh, for like $2,500. And I'm like, I'm going to bid 2000, see what happens. And they're like, okay. So I bought the domain for $2,000. That's amazing. Well, I hope that, I hope that sometime in the next year that I can come to Atlanta. I have a couple of clients in Atlanta and we can sit down and have a conversation in a tap room somewhere. Oh, without a doubt. There's actually also a coffee shop called Taproom Coffee in Atlanta. And I always huh. feel a strong desire just to like work out of there for a day, just to be on brand with where I am and who, what business I'm running. Yeah, absolutely. No, I, I love it. I love the name. I love the concept behind it. I'm curious, Kelly, have there been any moments where, um, you know, I don't want to say you've thought about quitting, but there's times where, I've found in my entrepreneurial journey where it's like, you know what? These are the days when people quit where you can like, you can feel it. Like you can kind of like see like, these are the hardships where I can see, or this is where some people would turn around. Have there been some of those moments for you where it's where things have just been challenging and you've really wondered if keeping going is worth it? Yeah, ab- absolutely. Um, last year and towards the end of last year, of course, Last year was pretty difficult for everybody, um, but we actually went from having three full-time employees at the end of uh, 2019 to having eight at the end of 2020. So it was a pretty significant year of growth for us. As as we all know, e-commerce just boomed in 2020. Um, as a result, uh, with growing the team came growing pains. And I hit a pretty rough patch in uh, October, November, December, just the the fourth quarter of the year where things were falling behind. I made some bad hiring decisions. I had some unhappy clients for one reason or another. And it's just, it was, it was a lot emotionally just to deal with what's happening with my team internally and also what's happening externally with the clients. And there were so many times that I texted my mentor and I was like, I mean, I could literally go get hired at Shopify today. Why don't I just do that? Why didn't you? I've, I've always been an entrepreneur at heart. I've always, I honestly, I'm good at running a business and I, thoroughly enjoy it. Yeah. Uh, you know, with, you know, there are bad days that come with anything. Um, but I, I don't see, I can't picture myself working for somebody else. Yeah. Why is that? Like why, um, I'm always curious to why people like me and others have chosen the entrepreneurial journey. Cause I mean, there's times where it just, it, it's for sure not the easiest. It just doesn't make sense sometimes, but I think that everybody has, reasons behind what we do. So why is this the life that you're excited about building of, you know, owning your own business, being an entrepreneur, having that freedom? I think a lot of it for me is security, which sounds kind of funny as like, as an entrepreneur, the last thing you feel when you're starting a new business is secure. But where I am now, I am, I'm owning my own security. I'm creating that, that, that own security. I'm creating jobs and I'm, I'm creating that security for my team as well, for them to grow, for them to, you know, improve in their careers, raise families, whatever it is that they're doing. And that gives me so much fulfillment. And so just owning, having a full ownership over what I'm doing has been one of my biggest driving factors. Yeah. Have you, um, have you seen like what kind of fulfillment have you came now that you're now that you're starting to see that? Like, I mean, I imagine with this scale that you guys are at that, um, yes, there's challenges, but you're also like seeing some of the rewards of trucking your own journey. So w- tell me about like, why, how has it been fulfilling for you? 
I am financially driven with goals. So I love hitting, you know, new, new financial goals, new revenue goals for my company. So I get fulfillment out of that. But I also get fulfillment out of being able to take like we've been really fortunate to be growing quickly, both in size and in revenue. And I can actually give back to the community in, you know, financially even. And I feel like that is something that it's, it's, a, it's something I've always wanted to do. And I finally feel like I'm in a position where I'm able to do that. And that's something that's really, you know, really important to me. Um, we're actually working on building out a full uh, junior developer uh, training program so we can start actually, uh, you know, hiring self-taught, hiring second career boot camp grads and giving them that, that real life work experience as a developer and train them up for everything they need to know. Obviously, we'd love to have them stay on with us, but they would be successful wherever they go because they've now been trained to work in the full environment. So these are the kinds of things that really give me fulfillment as being an entrepreneur and, and where we're at now and having the success that we've had, being able to you know have these opportunities, but really run with them. That's amazing. And I think, I think that you're almost looking back to where you were as an 11 year old building websites as a 14 year old selling, you know, starting to freelance. Is that some of the motivation behind that? Like wanting to give other young people some of the resources, maybe at an earlier age? Without a doubt. Yeah. I think there's a lot that can be done and, and there's so many more resources available now than there were right. uh, when I was learning how to code. But I think, I think most of like for me, a lot of people never realized that programming was even an option for them, something that they could learn and, and grow and become good at and love, honestly. And I want to be able to show them that this is actually a career opportunity for them, regardless of age, really. Right. Yeah. How hard is it to get started? Like, can 15 year olds get started doing it? Can 65 year olds get started programming and really creating value through programming that then they can monetize? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, there are so many uh, like free coding resources online that you can you can get started with. And they're very uh, you get you get immediate feedback from any of them. And so you're able to watch yourself learn. Um, my mother in law will occasionally pop onto one of those like Code Academy, for example, and, and just start taking some kind of programming lesson. I mean, it does not matter whether whether, as you said, whether you're 15 or whether you're 65, these tools are available right. for anybody to learn. It's absolutely something that can be learned. Yeah, I, th I think it's amazing how you know, like we were saying when when we were young and both on MySpace, like I remember feeling feeling like I was kind of like a tech a tech wizard because <laughs> I could like customize my MySpace. And I remember that was the first time I like got an idea of what HTML code was. Oh, yeah. um, and now there's just so many more opportunities for kids. Like that was me, you know, 14, 15, and I didn't pursue a career in coding or development or anything. But I remember kind of being really intrigued at this idea of customizing. And it's pretty, it's pretty mind-blowing in the last 15 years, like how many more educational resources there are for young people. When you were young, when you were younger, like really getting to hone your skills and all this, like, are there, what did you wish that you had? What, what were some resources that you're like, man, I wish that I had that when I was 16 years old? I think one of the things that I really missed out on when I was younger is having actual projects to work on. I think the resources that exist now provide inspiration for for what you can build and how you can run with it. Even just taking a simple idea that somebody else proposes and being able to build a, an app or build a website or something like a tool uh, just based on somebody else's idea that's available. I also lacked the community right. that's around learning how to code. I Again, being 11 years old, I was not on Twitter. Um, so I, I couldn't, you know, I didn't have resources to just reach out and ask questions and get that feedback. And now there's such a strong community around learning how to code. I, I, I absolutely love what's available now. Yeah, yeah, I think I think that's uh, that's amazing. And yeah, just seeing what's available. And there's so much free stuff, too. There's a lot of great, you know, if you're wanting to put in resources, there's those opportunities, but there's so many free opportunities as well. Uh, I'm curious if you're into the gaming scene at all, because that's one area where I've heard like there's teenagers that are 
making insane amounts of money that are like coding <laughs> coding items for for Minecraft and for games these days. And so, um, yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that and kind of explain a little bit, like help us understand how that works. Yeah, so this is definitely not my area of expertise um, when it comes to gaming. I have a Nintendo Switch and I occasionally play the old games that I loved to play when I was younger, like Spyro and Crash Bandicoot, um, the occasional Zelda. <laughs> but yeah, so these these games that have been created that are kind of like open world creativity, they created a marketplace and, and the tools that you need for anybody to go in and, and create objects within these games. And you're able to actually sell these through like a marketplace, for example. And other people who are playing the games are able to purchase those to use in their own world, quote unquote. Um, and, and yeah, you can you can really make so much money from it. Just, you know, uh, there's depends on what you're making and when you get in and how unique your items are, how useful they are, things like that. But there's a, there's a, there's a, an actual market for it. Yeah. Do you often look back at, you know, at the market, the marketplaces that are available now? I think like, man, if I was, if I was 15 or if I was in college, then I, I would definitely be, you know, coming up with some more creative solutions to be getting paid from my dorm room. <laughs> Without a doubt, you know, looking back at some of the things that have been created that are now successful companies as well. Like I thought about doing that well, a long time ago. I just didn't maybe have the skill set at the time. But I just I think it's so cool to to see as kids, especially just taking these opportunities to uh, to explore their entrepreneurial side. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we, we have some questions starting to come in. Um, so we have Terry and Trent on stage. So Terry, if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself, would love to know uh, what question you have for Kelly. Hi, Seth. Hi, Kelly. Can you hear me? Sure can. Hello. Yep. I'm really enjoying your show. Thanks for for doing this. And and uh, and you both sound great, by the way, uh, audio wise. I know we've been oh, all nice. learning how to get the best audio with the with the new format. Uh, I wanted to just. It's not really a question. I just wanted to comment and say I appreciate Kelly so much your your generosity and the information that you're sharing, especially with Prisa. Um, I find it really refreshing and it's actually very useful information. But um, I really kind of share both of your uh, philosophies that that to be able to share the information that we weren't able to get freely and clearly. Uh, when we were putting our businesses together, uh, it's just important to share it. And I really appreciate that you're doing it. I, I'm, I'm very impressed and, and appreciative. Well, thank you. Yeah, I, I definitely think it's important to share these things. I mean, I, I speak with agency owners of, you know, multinational agencies. And I'm like, how are you charging for this? What are you paying yourself? What are you paying your employees? And they share this information with me which I think is incredibly important because I want to make sure that I'm scaling appropriately as well. And I can learn from those who are, you know, th two, three, four steps ahead of me, learn from their mistakes, learn from their successes and follow that same path. And so I want to do the same thing for those who are, you know, two, three, four steps behind me. So they can also become alongside me and, and have that same success I'm enjoying. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, it's Kelly, earlier, earlier in your show, um, in, in, in the show that you broadcasted earlier, we talked a little bit about um, value-based pricing. Yeah. Can you just share uh, for a few minutes and um, you kind of based off of what Terry said, like share a little bit about your perspective on why companies, individuals, freelancers should not be really going after discount pricing, but should really be like pricing or services based off of value. Yeah. So for those who are unfamiliar with the concept of value based pricing, uh, you're pricing based on the perceived value of what the other the, the other party is going to be getting from it. So I would not be charging the same thing for a small mom and pop knitting store down the down the street from me uh, compared to what I would be charging a company like Coca-Cola to build out a brand for them. It just they they're going to. Uh, financially benefit from what I'm building to a much greater scale, they're going to have a larger budget to work with. And so by basing your pricing around the value of what you're delivering, you're able to serve the smaller businesses while also still 
being profitable and, and scale your own business by working with these larger businesses as well. Um, this is something that we've been we I've been I've been really working on practicing in, you know, in my day to day, you know, in, in signing on as we move up market, especially we're working with larger, larger businesses with much larger budgets and kind of putting it in the perspective of I, and, and again, this kind of goes back to making sure I'm actually charging enough is is increasing my rates with them. And I don't really get pushback, which also, you know, leads me to believe that maybe I'm still not charging enough. <laughs> right. Yeah, absolutely. Terry, did you have uh, did that kind of answer or kind of respond to your comment? Or is there any other questions that you have? Well, it did, but it opened up a new question for me, which is interesting because a lot of my clients like yours uh, are I'm in the music business, but uh, some are very high profile and have bigger budgets and others are independent artists who don't have the same kind of budgets. And but the the amount of time that it takes to work with them is still the same. Of course, I always try to be open. Uh, you know, budget wise so that that I can work with anybody that I want to work with at whatever point of their career that they're at. But do you I guess my question is, isn't it the same amount of work when you're doing a mom and pop as as you're doing a corporation with a fifty thousand dollar budget? It really depends. I actually find the corporations to tend to require more of our time. Okay. Uh, there tend to be a lot more meetings, uh, a lot of, like additional sign off that's required, additional revisions. Um, we often have more complex work coming through that as well, like building a custom app for a store, for example, versus just like a, a basic Shopify setup. So we are able to to charge accordingly in that sense as well. Um, and, you know, I having so many employees offering health insurance, the retirement Retirement, all this does add up in terms of our overhead. So I have to be cognizant of who we're signing on on the on the smaller side as well to make sure that our, our work is still profitable and I'm actually able to, you know, make payroll. <laughs> Thank you for answering that. Yeah, sure thing. Yeah, Terry, thanks so much for jumping on stage. We're going to go ahead and move to Russ. Russ, thanks for joining. What question do you have for Hi. Oh, Hi, Kelly. Hi, Seth. <laughs> I've really enjoyed, I mean, thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. I did have to jump off for a conference call, unfortunately, but I will be listening to the replay. Uh, you touched on a few things I have questions on, so I'm going to just focus to like one <laughs> or two. First of all, Kelly, what a cool backstory you have. Coding at 11. I just love that dad ruining the first dollar story. That was just a <laughs> lot of fun. Uh, yeah. I have a question for you real quick. I'm I'm designing a website and I need your font advice should i go with railway or hey, bleeding cowboy somebody just listened to <laughs> <episode>. <laughs> oh, and somebody's uh tuning in while walking dogs too so i apologize guys <laughs> um real quick on the value-based billing boy that is really relevant to me i've been trying to crack the code on that myself i i'm a ghostwriter an editor and produce podcasts and other media and i'm exactly the same way i like working with the little guys but i don't want to you know they don't have the huge budgets um, and I'll tell you, when I joined my first PR firm out of journalism, my boss sat me down and said, Russ, this is the holy grail. If you can help me crack this, we will be successful. And we never figured out how to get out of just regular standard hourly billing. He wanted to do value based. So I thought that was really, that's a really interesting topic. Uh, my question is, uh, I work with a teen. I've talked about him on fireside chats before, uh, and he's got an interest in fashion. And like he's lined up like an hourly job where he, he can like pay his bills and he wants to maybe set up like an online marketplace where I guess starting off, he'd be going to thrift stores and just like picking through good items, you know, like brand, you know, label items, for example, and setting up a little e-commerce store. And I don't have any way of knowing like if that's a thing I should encourage and if that's realistic, is that a good idea? And if so, like where, like where he would start. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I actually do. Uh, so particularly in the thrifting apparel side of things, you don't necessarily have to start your own Shopify store for this. There are actually tools that exist online or services that exist online that would be perfect for this. Uh, Poshmark is one that's really, really popular in selling apparel. And I actually see the same people who are successful on Poshmark also sell uh, their their clothes on on eBay as well. I learned an interesting fact about eBay the other day, as we all kind of associate eBay with these auctions. Only 20% of their listings are now auctions. Everything else is buy it now. 
That's wild. I would have never right? thought that. I'm curious, kind of as a follow up with that, Russ, uh, can you help us? Well, as a follow up to Russ's question, Kelly, can you help us understand uh, when does somebody need like a custom solution versus should they just get like, you know, the Shopify plugin on their WordPress site or should they ever do that? Like, help us understand kind of like the stages of I'm selling things online and when do I need to like actually hire somebody like you? Yeah. So, the beauty of Shopify is that they've got it's it's a very accessible pr uh, platform for getting started and their documentation is really great and their customer service is really great. So you're actually able to get up and running. If you're looking to sell anything, it's a great place to start. Uh, the only reason why I wasn't really strongly encouraging it on the thrift, the thrifting clothes side of things uh, is just because there are actual services and like marketplaces that exist that really, really support that space. You could absolutely be successful at having a Shopify store as well if you wanted to go that route. Uh, but then, of course, you are going to be looking at dealing with the the legal and accounting side of things, making sure you're charging sales tax where it needs to go, dealing with shipping, making sure your policies are all set. Uh, so just some things to kind of be cognizant of if you do decide to take that path. In terms of, you know, asking for help or, or where you should get started, uh, Shopify, you mentioned uh, having Shopify on a WordPress site. Shopify this is not well known. They have a light plan that's $9 a month that allows you to create what are called buy buttons that lets hmm. you create products with Shopify. It generates a button for you to embed on any website. So if you're already on WordPress and you just want to add some links to purchase some things, you're able to do that. And then it takes you to Shopify's checkout to actually complete the purchase, which is great because Shopify's checkout is known for being performance. It's known for being secure. It's trusted. So you get that added benefit of the Shopify trust badge while still keeping your store elsewhere. I, of course, love seeing Shopify storefronts as a whole. Um, and, and there are so many really great Shopify themes in the Shopify theme store that you can either install for free or purchase. And they're anywhere from $0 up to, I think the most expensive theme I've seen is like $450, uh, not on the Shopify theme store, mm. but it's a really great place to start. And honestly, even merchants doing millions of dollars annually, they still don't necessarily need a custom theme unless there is a very strong reason to go custom. The beauty of Shopify themes is that yeah. it's it provides you with a really nice starting point without having to reinvent the entire wheel and design the entire site from scratch, rebuild the entire site from scratch. You have access to all of the template files already. So a developer can go in and be like, hey, this is what I want to start with, but I want to change the way this is laid out and I want to add this feature. And you can do all of that. Yeah, I think it's amazing. Again, what what's just available? All it, it was so much more challenging to, you know, to kind of solve the same problems ten years ago. And now there really is solutions. No matter where you are, whether you're just starting, and that, I didn't know about that button solution, but that's that's so that's amazing. There's actually um, a client that I have that I, I think something that simple is probably what they need. Uh, exactly. And and yeah, again, having that security of actually going through Shopify as opposed to, you know, people want to know that things are secure. In the last like 10, 15 minutes of this interview, again, want to remind anybody that wants to come and ask a question. Um, we got Trent who's getting ready to come up here. I'm curious to ask you, Kelly, uh, you've been an entrepreneur for five years. Uh, give us one or two things that if you could rewind in time and just drop a little bit of knowledge in your brain for your first year of business, like what knowledge do you wish you had five years ago as a business owner that you now have now? The first thing that I would absolutely tell myself is to increase your rates. Um, <laughs> yeah. Make the connections with other agencies as well. I think that'd probably be the second one or other freelancers. There's always been such a strong community, uh, especially within Shopify. And I think really putting myself and inserting myself into the community has allowed me to make really strong connections with other agencies, which they refer work to me. I refer work out to them. I'm making these really strong relationships that have, you know, really evolved to uh, growing my business and them growing their business alongside me as well. So those would probably be the two things. And I think if I were to give myself a third, it would be, Get an office space sooner. I, I I know work living in like a remote work world now, but I love having my own office. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. That's uh, great input. Um, 
Oh, bummer. We just had Trent up here, and then he just – something Trent just happened. Trent might reappear because it looks like he may have accidentally closed the app or, or left the Okay, room. <laughs> he's – yep, he's he's coming up. Um, okay, I want to welcome Trent. Uh, first, yes, this I'm, is Trent's I'm completely like, first new hour right now. to Fireside. <laughs> welcome. So, Trent, welcome to Fireside. Um, so I'm Trent, obviously. Um, now I've run an agency for almost 15 years now. But the question I had, which is – something I go back and forth about uh, is the thought process behind doing a, when you're looking at a single product or like a single product with a couple different upsells for Mm e-commerce and pushing that towards whether you're doing a funnel style or something like Shopify. And I would be curious to get your thoughts on that. Yeah. So I am always going to be, if you're doing anything e-commerce related, I'm always going to say pro Shopify. Um, I'm a little biased there, obviously, but one of the things I think that's really great about, even for single product sites, one of the biggest drivers of uh, traffic to the site is going to be content and building on top of Shopify while also adding the additional informational pages, educational section, adding a blog will continue to build up the domain authority for that website and really allow you to, to, uh, get that additional traffic to obviously eventually hopefully get them to purchase and increase that conversion rate. Gotcha. Okay. That makes sense because and I'm not overly familiar with Shopify in, in all fairness. I come from the other side, the funnel side where you're doing more one-off marketing. <laughs> right. um, so do you still have, and maybe this is my naivety, but um, do you still have the ability to do all the additional upsells and all that inside Shopify? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and that's okay. something that we do all the time, both cross styles and upsells. Very cool. That was it. That was my big, that was my question. Yeah. Thanks for asking. Cool. Yeah. That's awesome. Thanks for, uh, thanks for jumping up and asking a question. Um, Trent. Yeah. And if anybody else uh, has a question that they want to ask Kelly, kind of as we start to wrap this up, um, feel free to raise your hand, come up on stage. Um, Kelly, what are you looking forward to? Like with your business, you know, in the next year or so, like what are, what are some of your plans and, kind of things that you have your your eyes focused on (laughs) one of the things i'm really looking forward to is actually getting to meet my team in person (laughs) it's a like meet with or meet for the first first time i mean we hired so many people last year and this year that i've never met any of them in person and we're a fully remote company so you know people are living all over the u.s got a, a couple contractors in canada got a couple contractors in the uk and it'd be really great to to meet everybody yeah absolutely um Atlanta and uh, Atlanta is a cool place to go. I, I we have some friends in Atlanta. I, feel, I find myself there once or twice a year, and there, there's a lot of cool things to do in that city. Not to mention, you guys have been like the center of the universe for the last nine months <laughs> in American in American history. Yeah, I've never met so many people who are familiar with the counties of Georgia. I know, right? I uh, yeah, I, it's it's funny how things can change. Well, Kelly, this has been wonderful, and uh, for anybody that's listening live or to the replay of this. Um, make sure you go and, and check Kelly out, follow her everywhere you can listen to her podcast. If you're interested in, I would say like almost just understanding more about the Shopify and the tech space. Like, as I've been looking at your content, I just think you do such a good job of simplifying it and kind of making some of these things that are really complex, kind of boiling them down and making them more easy to digest. So Kelly, what's the best way that people can get in touch with you? And um, do you have any shows or any things in particular that you, you know, you want to kind of highlight right now? Yeah. So you can find me on Twitter at KVLLY. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn at, well, LinkedIn, just Kelly Vaughn <laughs> is my name there on you there. Go. Um, the tap room is the taproom.com. You can also find my, uh, if you need to reach out to me directly, uh, my personal website is KVLLY.com as well. Um, I think those are the most places you can find me. Uh, again, uh, Commerce Tea, we publish new episodes every Tuesday and we do a show on Fireside every Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern. And for Ladybug Podcast, we publish new episodes every Monday. Awesome. Well, Kelly, this has been wonderful. Uh, I look forward to listening to more of your commerce tea shows and uh, just getting to see where your journey is going, especially as it sounds like you have more opportunity to give back in some of the ways that you've really wanted. So thanks so much for sharing your story. I really appreciate you coming on here today. Thank you so much for having me.
Absolutely.